User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way! Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at ugtastic.com. Hi, it's Mike with Ugtastic. I'm still here at Web Visions 2013 for the Gene Cisco Film Center in Chicago. I'm sitting down with Bill Scott. Bill is the, well, somebody who was recommended to me by more people than anybody else today uh, that somebody I should sit down and talk with. Uh, Bill is a, uh, well, you, you work with PayPal, yep. but can you describe what your title is? Because it was a little bit yeah. more so, than I could so, <laughs> so I head up uh, what's called, what I call user interface mm -hmm. and engineering. Right. And uh, so think of it as the front end development, front end engineering for PayPal. Mm -hmm. uh, all the web technologies, mobile top and desktop, all the things. Um, you know, so, so my background basically is I came from Netflix before I came to PayPal. I was the head of the UI engineering there, closely with the design team uh, for about four years. Right. Built that uh, team up, the engineering team. And then uh, before that I was in Yahoo, and there I did like the Yahoo Design Pattern Library. I was also the Ajax and Angelist at Yahoo. Okay. And, uh, and my, my passion is really around design engineering. So a few small companies. Yeah, a few small companies. And I also have a a book with O'Reilly called Designing Web Interfaces. Okay. It's strictly a design book. Okay. So I'm one of those weird hybrids that uh, that can do JavaScript engineering, but also do design. What What is the uh, animal on Mine is the most amazing one possible. So the design books have birds, right? Yeah. So mine is the cock of the rock. <laughs> <laughs> That's... I'm the only... Yeah, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't pick it. Yeah, yeah. They picked it, so... Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that's always fun to find out what the animal was. Yeah. Um, I have to get a picture of it. Uh, yes. Because <laughs> uh, the, uh, the one in my head is not. Yeah, it's TMI. <laughs> uh, so, so okay, so, I mean, obviously you have a, a, a very broad depth of experience. Um, and, but there's one thing that's in particular interesting that's just happened with PayPal here in Chicago. Yeah. Uh, and that is the... Uh, Acquisition of Braintree, one of our major yeah. uh, financial um, uh, credit card service companies that are acquired by PayPal. Yeah. Uh, do you have any insight into what happened? Or? Well, I know I know the so the arc that, that it ties in really well with what I even talked about uh, at the workshop and today at the talk. Uh, we've been on a journey to transform PayPal and become an innovative company. Right. Uh, PayPal has been a very good brand and, and very successful. In the, uh, money it's made and those sort of things like that. But when I was leaving Netflix in 2011, it was pretty obvious that, that PayPal wasn't really on my radar as a company to go to, but I knew a few key folks there, including the CTO, that I had a lot of respect for from the previous things they had done. And so they began talking about coming. And we started a journey when David Marcus became president in April of 2012. Uh, to transform PayPal to be very lean and more like a startup. Hence right. the use of lean UX. So the acquisition of Braintree really is another step in that evolution. It's like, here, here's obviously an incredible company that started up as uh, moved at lightning speed is making a huge impact on the payments industry. Uh, definitely strong in the development community with awesome APIs. Also they had Venmo in New York, which is a great, a great mobile app. So we got mobile talent, API talent. We are already transferring our APIs. But this just kind of takes us to the next level, really. And one of the cool things we're going to do, because David is a huge, he's a serial entrepreneur, our president, until PayPal, he only did startups, right? Uh, until he got acquired by PayPal. So he's going through the acquisition team. So. Now he's... Right, now he's acquired. Yeah. So it's very, very important that we let Braintree continue to be the innovator it is, have, you know, still... Be called Braintree. Be, you know, be able to uh, to to not really change anything, other than give it a great broader breadth and uh, much more you know, financial support in the larger eBay family. And it fits really well with the whole eBay family. So we're, we're, we're really excited. In fact, I met Michael Wilkie, who's here as one of the product uh, designers, product managers. Uh, he's actually in my talk, and we got a quick chance to, to chat. Yeah, and, and the Braintree, I know, and I've actually interviewed uh, one developer from the uh, Utesic, and just extremely well respected developer from uh, in Chicago. Um, uh, but I, 
So that's current events, but I, I'm interested in your book and also the concept of clean wax that you're teaching. Yeah. And what does that mean? Yeah. So uh, if you're familiar with Jeff Godhelm's book, uh, Lean UX, which follows on... I'm more on the deck side, so... Okay, cool, yeah. Yeah, so uh, if you think about Lean Startup, your Lean Startup really is about, you know, how do I get to the customer as quick as possible? How do I validate my risky assumptions? How do I pivot into the right Oh, the Lean Startup. Lean Startup. Sorry, That's okay, no, no. Lean UX follows on to that, so Jeff Godhelm actually wrote the book on Lean UX, and we started using the same ideas. What Lean UX really says is, Hey, if you're going to be doing design, uh, you know, it's not really about delivering documentation. It's about delivering experience and doing that collaboratively with engineering, with design, with product, all together. So you're closing some of those loops. Some of those yeah, break those walls down, be very collaborative in nature. Uh, as much as possible, we either live in the same room or the same space together and operate like a startup. Like a startup. And so this is very apropos to a large company like PayPal that uh, had, you know, from an innovation perspective, had uh, obviously stagnated. Uh, coming up to 2011, it just, it just took, it could take six weeks to change the words on the side. And so now we're down to less than five minutes, you know, just based on, because we, we wait five minutes to check the web, you know, you know, uh, the web we're going to get. Uh, so it's, you know, we, we've been transforming the technology stack and I talked about that yesterday in the workshop a little bit. <laughs> All with this idea in mind of how do you get engineering? So, so I'm actually writing another book right now for the Lean Startup series called Lean Engineering. Okay. And the idea of Lean Engineering is if you think about engineering from the perspective of enabling and learning, right. what do you do different in engineering? Well, one of the things you do differently is you actually engineer for prototyping. You don't think of prototyping as a separate activity. You actually think of the product should support prototyping. So we actually engineered our architecture now so that the prototype stack is the same as the production stack. We use Node.js, we use some JavaScript tippling on top of that. We can run that on our Java stack, or our Node stack, or our C++ stack, you know, our, our templates. So what we do in prototype, in a like weekly or every other week basis, we can feed right in the Agile stream, and it's going to become, you know, with a little more massaging, become our production code. So you actually get this economy uh, you know, then you can also take the product and fork it and get, you know, and just do some, uh, you know, some usability studies, what we call Lean UX Scrum Team, and then take it right back into Agile. So how different is that from the concepts of, like, MVP, the minimum viable product? Yeah. Is it, is it the same? It supports basic? it. Oh, it okay. supports it. Because what you can do if you've got a real rapid prototyping stack is you can create an MVP. Now, you can create, you know, there's a larger process of, you know, going out to customers, doing home visits, or doing studies or surveys or whatever else. That may include just paper prototyping, or using, you know, something like a tool like a prototype on paper, which take pictures of your sketches, stitch them together, and you got a working prototype. Or, you know, maybe it's like an action, which is a prototyping tool. There's a lot of tools you can use. Uh, but what I was been talking about the last two days is really more what happens when you get that closer to agile, yeah. and you actually want to want to somehow marry design into the agile process which has been a, a long time question. And the way we've solved that is by having what we call a Lean UX Scrum team that uh, runs just a little bit ahead of the Agile Scrum team. Uh, but some of the same team members flip between the two teams. And the Lean UX Scrum team is focused on pushing out prototypes and, and showing it to customers. That's their sprint releases. Okay. Whereas the Agile student delivers the code that you don't buy. Okay, so, so that's interesting. So you have these two teams that are running in parallel or near parallel, yeah. a little bit off from each other, and using two slightly different methodologies for, for delivery. Yeah. Uh, what was what was the reason that one was using the Scrum methodology and the other one was using Well, they're both, they both use sort of a Scrum methodology. You know, the Lean UX does, so Agile, you know, Agile Scrum has a lot of it. They like to call it ceremonies. Right. Process. The stand-ups, the weekly yeah. iterations. Right. Right. Yeah. So there's still there's still the concept of stand-ups, you know, in the lean you know, scrum team, uh, but there's not like a lot of stories in the backlog. It's very simple. It's much more hypothesis driven. You're much more, you know, rapidly sketching or creating a design, getting it prototype form, and then getting it usability testing so you can learn from it. And then what comes out of that, you know, feeds out of that, is stories for the backlog of Agile, code that you can actually reuse because you can develop the UI to a, to a fairly you know, rough state, you know, it's uh, got the happy pass and stuff. 
and you've got uh, some of the application built too, and so that we can take and harden that. And what we like to do is flip engineers between the main and the agile, so they are always like here with the customer setup. So this much more of a customer setup. Yeah, it, it, that's very interesting because it's. That makes me think of like the spike into uh, production, uh, kind of a yeah, uh, concept. You just build something that's just good enough, and then yeah. Yeah. You just clean it up and put it into yeah. the production code base. Yeah. yeah. So I think it is, I heard somebody you know on the design side use the same you know engineering say CI/CD you know, continuous integration continuous deployment. We can think of continuous innovation continuous design. Right. So the, the design is, is always a problem. Yeah. Um, looking back at uh, some of the big companies and trying to bring in these agile or working with more agile methodologies in these larger companies that might be a little bit more, um, let's say, traditional. Yeah. Uh, a little, maybe a little bit stuck in a rut as is is it happens in larger organizations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, has that been something that's been uh, openly embraced uh, from the bottom up, or has it been pushed down? It's been bottom up and top down, yeah. and outside in, I would say, too. You know, if you're actually if you look at change models, generally the best change models are top down, uh, up, you know, bottom up, and new DNA from the outside coming in. Because you do need new DNA in an organization. Because big organizations that have gotten static, what's happened is, you know, they don't even know why they do stupid stuff, right? right. They just do stupid stuff as they do it. And there's actually smart people in there, but the smart people act stupid, right. you know, because this is the way organizations work like that. And you, and then you have some bad DNA, and you have some antibodies that are in the organization that resist change. And so you have to flush the system out. You have to like, you know, uh, get rid of some of those antibodies, change some of those antibodies into actually being something positive uh, to get change going. So yeah, it's, you know, I mean, PayPal, frankly, coming in 2011, Netflix, uh, I knew what it was like. Uh, Done a lot of investigation. It was it was screwed up. I mean, screwed up from technology, from process, and design. Everything was. I don't think there was a single, you know, organization from. I'm thinking from a customer centric perspective, that was really operating right. Uh, and some of that's you know because they they had to at some point right the ship, and really turn the dial towards risk. You know, be risk averse. Make sure payments went through. Uh, and, in, and in that whole uh, pick-up swing, you lose the experience. You lose the fact that you're freezing accounts and putting the accounts on hold that are very good people, that are doing charity, that are doing whatever else, and all those stories get out there. Yeah. And over time, it creates this very angry, because what you do with people's mind personally affects them, right. and they don't forget it. Yeah and, yeah, and you're right. I hadn't even thought about that before this interview, but about the... Uh, there's the constant story on Reddit about the yeah. my this charity or my Kickstarter got frozen. Yep. I don't know why. Yep. And what we do is what I mean, David does is I do this. A bunch of us do this. We're watching Reddit. We're watching Hacker News. We're watching Twitter. As soon as we see something like that, we go fix the problem. But then what we do is we look under the cover saying, "Okay, what's the policy change that needs to happen?" Sometimes those things aren't overnight. You know, for example, I had uh, I forget who it was exactly. But I had, you know, one of the conference organizers, you know, he, all of a sudden he got his accounts frozen line, and we went to work on it, and, you know, it was obvious that, look, th this is a common occurrence. You can't just say if somebody's, all of a sudden, money starts coming in really, really fast, that that's a bad thing, you know, because there are certain scenarios where that works. So the risk team has to develop different models, models you know, because yeah. you think about it, you got 120 million customers. You know, it's not like somebody sitting there going, I'm going to freeze this account. It's just computer algorithms, right? Very much, right. And then what happens? You have if your, you know, call center support team is not enabled to fix those problems, then you, you double whammy it, right? Right. So it's just stuck in the mind. So David did things like you know the the, the team actually uh, that does call center support. Some of them they, they actually enable them with what they call tokens, almost like Google tokens. Right. Where basically if they they can take one of those tokens and fix any problem, and can't get fired, they can't oh, get right. in trouble. If they make a mistake, you learn from the mistake. So you have a certain amount of these tokens you can kind of utilize to get out of jail. It's interesting. It's like, get out you're going to enable, you. we're going to trust you, you yeah. do, just do what you got to do, Yeah. but we're going to have a safeguard. Where yeah, and it's a little bit of spending there you have yeah. to do with it. You know, so you don't know, go so willy-nilly, you, know, you, you, know, you think about it, and you know, yeah, this is obviously what you should fix. Yeah. You know? So those kind of things have changed. And we actually, you know, uh, 
I don't know the exact number, but it's a pretty high number uh, each month, less account freezes, less account holds. Funny story, I'll give you a funny story. So uh, last, uh, earlier this year, there was a story came on Hacker News about this kid who created a JavaScript library, an animation library. And he was a junior in, in college, uh, actually, in Northern Kentucky University. And uh, PayPal had locked his account because uh, he made a tremendous, I mean, I'm talking about a tremendous amount of money uh, in a very short period of time. And he got on Hacker News and said, I think he said something like, you know, I made about $200,000. And uh, PayPal's locked my account. Yeah. So we saw it. We immediately went to work, unlocked his account, and we hired him. So oh, really? <laughs> came in and did amazing stuff for us, one of the best interns I've ever had. Yeah. And he's coming back to the minimum office. He's coming back next year and doing some more stuff. Had a blast. We were about to do a bunch of articles about that. And I really love doing that because, you know, PayPal has been. I gave a talk in Ireland last week, uh, Node Comics. And uh, one of the guys was writing up stories about it. He said, he called my talk mesmerizing because he said all of us in the crowd had written PayPal off as being in the dark ages. Right. Right. And it was so refreshing because, you know, we're leading the charge on Node. We're one of the companies that's actually. We're about to open source a bunch of you new know, frameworks. But, you know, we brought a bunch of people from the outside, from other companies. We also had some great people inside that were already there. And we're, and we're changing. I kind of like that story. That's a funny story for me, is, you know, how do I get engineering design work together? How do I get great technology? And frankly, I'm having no trouble recruiting at all. I'm getting some really great people. Because, you know, people, at the end of the day, engineers and designers, whoever, what you're going to work on is really an impact. So we got that. Who are you going to work with? So I've brought some great people in from lots of good companies. That's important. And how you're going to work, that's this lean UX, lean style of working, is critical. If you get the who, how, and the what down right, yeah. of course you got to pay decent. <laughs> have good, maybe good location helps. Um, but those are all, those are all, you know, they're not the main thing, right? People make all kinds of sacrifices to get the how, who, and the what. Well, I mean, it sounds like you, one of the things, one of the things when you hear about a story like, uh, the young man who made two hundred thousand dollars off his library yeah. is—he's got some decent seed money that he could spend with the next yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, but convincing him that you obviously had to bring something other than just pure money yeah. to him yeah. and say yeah. you're going to have this environment where you're going to be have some latitude and some yeah. freedom to do something interesting. With well, for, you know, fortunately, at the same time, I, I've hired a, a friend of mine who. He used to head up search at Netflix. And he'd gone on to be the CTO of mobile at Zynga. Previously, he had been at Amazon to help build the initial cloud in the early days of Mac OS. So the guy's well traveled. Yeah. He's you a know, wonderful guy. So uh, we were able to bring Emmanuel, the intern, in and work directly with Ron. So he got to work with one of the best clients yeah. you know, around. And, uh, and, and that's something that isn't that, just money, that's more than money. Right, yeah. right. And then, of course, Jeff Harrell, my team, is just. Really brilliant, and another guy, Eric, that I brought from Netflix, and a few other folks that came from Netflix, are just really smart, awesome guys who get the full package of not just it's just not engineering, but it's design, it's customer centric, and that's what drives someone like Emmanuel, right? Uh, this intern is at the end of the day, he's passionate about creating the best experience possible. I mean, he would he would sit there and go, you know, when I do this, because he was building an HTML5 equivalent during the that. And, and nailing it, infinite scrolling, and doing all the crazy, complicated stuff. Yeah. And he's going like, "Look, when I move this, you know, and I can see it because I'm a pixel maniac too. Right. But some of the people on the team couldn't see it. it, it every once in a while, j jigs by one pixel. <laughs> that just drove him nuts. Yeah. He's going to get that right. And I love that attention to detail. Uh, and it, of course, I have that too. So I think he enjoyed working, working with you. me because I would come back and say, you know. The friction is not exactly right. You know, the, the physics is not exactly right on this issue of live experience versus the native. He said, "Well, how so?" And I'd show him. You know, I say, no, "Notice that. You know, how the ease out of the very last. You know, a little bit slows down." And so, within about an hour, he came back, checked this out, and he had it nailed. Yeah, yeah. And he loved that. You know, the being challenged like that. So yeah, um, and, and, and knowing that he's working with people he can respect. Yeah, that's, yeah. You know that. I mean, it's not about that you won't respect who you're working with, but oh, wow. somebody who's you, you want to be challenged. Yeah, right? who's going to push you and be like somebody who's been there. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, thank you very much for giving yes. time to stop. I really enjoyed it. It's great to meet you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. 
User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way! Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at ugtastic.com.